Welcome to Excess Returns, where we focus on what works over the long term in the markets. Join us as we talk about the strategies and tactics that can help you become a better long-term investor. It's Justin Carboneau and Jack Forehand are principals at Validia Capital Management. The opinions expressed in this podcast do not necessarily reflect the opinions of Validia Capital. No information on this podcast should be construed as investment advice. Securities discussed in the podcast may be holdings of clients of Validia Capital. Hey guys, this is Justin. In this episode of Excess Returns, Jack and I sit down with investment advisor, value investor, and newly minted author Adam Mead to talk about his new book, The Complete Financial History of Berkshire Hathaway. Adam spent five years researching and studying Berkshire's history, and he walks us through some of the company's major milestones and drivers of value over time. This is a valuable discussion for anyone interested in learning about Warren Buffett and how Berkshire Hathaway was built. Adam also provides us with some great charts and visuals to aid in the discussion. As always, thank you for listening. We hope you enjoy this discussion with Adam Mead. Adam, thank you for joining us today. Great to be here. Thanks for having me. Your new book titled The Complete Financial History of Berkshire Hathaway, Chronological Analysis of Warren Buffett and Charlie Munger's Conglomerate Masterpiece. It's actually a pretty, um, it's, it's a pretty short book, right? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it, it is. Compared to the, the over 10,000 pages that I, uh, I read to put into it, uh, the uh, mere 800 pages uh, is pretty short. Yep. <laughs> Which is amazing, by the way. I mean, that's to write, you know, and I know some of it's like just gathering material and content that Berkshire and Buffett has put out there. But I mean, this is going to, you know, it seems like it's going to be like the definitive guide of Berkshire Hathaway and its history. And I'm excited to get it um, when it comes out. I think I can purchase it on Amazon now, but it's not yet quite released. But I wanted to ask you, um, you know, how does an uh, uh, investor that goes to his first meeting Berkshire Hathaway meeting in 2012, end up writing an 800-page book about the history of Berkshire Hathaway. I mean, how, how did you get there? It just sort of happened. Uh, you know, one thing led to another. And so, yeah, so my first meeting was in 2012. And uh, I just, I, I'd been wanting to go out there for a couple of years and, and just ended up just going out there. And, and it's been amazing ever since. And so, like a lot of people, I just fell in love with value investing and, and Buffett. And like he says, when he read Security Analysis and The Intelligent Investor, like the scales just fell from his eyes. So I just digested everything there was on Berkshire Hathaway. And I just, over time, I just had this sort of nagging sense that I wanted more. There was just this book that I hadn't found, which was Berkshire A to Z, chronological. Um, I mean, I'm the kind of guy that you know, a couple of years ago, uh, Buffett stopped doing this, but he would say uh, the MSR businesses had a 20% return on tangible equity. What I would go dig into the financial statements and say, well, how did he get that number? And so I kind of wrote the book for myself and uh, I never had, I, I don't have any illusions that it's going to be a, a bestseller. I certainly take Charlie Munger's advice uh, of low expectations, but if there's a couple couple others out there like me that you know really like both the history as well as as the, the numbers uh, you know that's the person that I, I wrote it for so I, I hope that as time goes on it, it will be somewhat timeless and it will be a place for that new student or investor or uh, you know student of Berkshire Hathaway can sort of get up to speed and, and relive the history of the company year by year and, and decade by decade and then for the seasoned investor, someone that's followed Berkshire Hathaway for a long time, you know, I hope to provide a fresh analysis, maybe some new, un un unearth some new little nuggets of information, as well as provide maybe a reference book of sorts where you can just go back to any particular year and uh, and refresh yourself. So I, I hope I hope it finds a place on I hope it deserves a place on uh, on folks' bookshelves. Yeah, that's great. You know, one of the things that Buffett, I think, often says is that he sort of tap dances to work because he loves his job so much. It almost sounds like for you in writing this book, you were probably tap dancing to, you know, wanting to write the book because it's something you were so interested in and passionate about. And, you know, probably a book like this, you know, you couldn't do it unless you did have that passion and interest. Yeah, it like I said, it just kind of came together. So I had this it's, it was a five year process. Uh, from start to finish and it was like 2015 16 
it, it kind of took shape and I had some communication with, with Lawrence Cunningham at that point. Uh, he actually, he had some people go to the Library of Congress, believe it or not, and, and dig up some financials for me, which was amazing. But uh, I, one thing led to another. And so I, I started, the idea was to start at 1955, which was 10 years before Buffett took over in 1965, and then walk forward year by year, decade by decade, uh, in 10 year increments. And so I sent the first two chapters, roughly 55 to uh, 1974, to Warren. And to my surprise, he wrote back and said, uh, this is great, glad you're doing it. Uh, wouldn't it be great if you went back to look at Berkshire in the, the, the pre-World War II through World War II era and, and take a look at this profitability, uh, the, this brief spike in, in profitability that Berkshire had. And so, you know, Warren Buffett's suggesting something, right? I, I'm going to do it. And so I ended up going all the way back. I said, well, if I'm going back to World War II, I might as well just go back to the beginning. And so the book actually starts at the origins of the textile industry, how that all happened in New England, and then walks through uh, the evolution of the company and all the predecessor companies up until 1955, and then ultimately 65 when Buffett takes over and we really get going. So, Yeah, wow, that's amazing. And we'll kind of get into um, some of those details in history, but you kind of hit on the next question a little bit. Um, uh, you talked to Lawrence Cunningham, who we've had in the podcast. You obviously sent the chapters to Buffett, which is awesome that he wrote back to you. But I mean, w was there other people that played an important role? I mean, you had some pretty big value investors um, giving you accolades on the book. So who are some of the people that have sort of helped uh, mold this along the way and, and, and folks that you've actually built some relationships with um, because of the book? Yeah, and, and even just to start, like the the amazing history of Berkshire Hathaway itself. I mean, it, it's a it's a business history book, but it's it's almost a biography, right? And and all these people and businesses that came together. So I'm extremely grateful for the work that they did, and and all the people that came before me. I mean, I, I'm I'm really standing on the the shoulders of others that came before me. Um, but you know, specifically, Guy Spear was just uh, has been an amazing friend and supporter throughout this, and just constantly reminding me how special Berkshire's culture is. And, and he's seen it up close. He's been to the meetings for over 20 years. And um, guys like Guy Spear and um, Monish Pabrai, Chris Bloomstrand, uh, who I was grateful enough, uh, he, he wrote the forward to the book. Just, you know, I he actually mentioned he was writing a book. And I said, oh, my gosh, if you're writing a book and it's on Berkshire Hathaway, I quit. Because he is, I don't know if you guys have, have read his letter, Semper Augustus. Uh, but he does these hundred plus page uh, digests on on Berkshire and and others, and it's just it's an amazing. Uh, he's he's like the go to guy. So uh, to my great uh, relief, Chris was not writing a book on Berkshire Hathaway, and, and he really helped me out. Uh, in addition to writing the forward, um, but you know, guys uh, guys like Pat Dorsey, I've had conversations with. Um, Jonathan Brandt and then and Chris Chris Bloomstrand put me in touch with Max Sykes, which ultimately led to to Mario and uh, Tom Russo. Like I've just been so fortunate to have this this input uh, to varying degrees uh, along this journey. So I, I'm extremely grateful. It's it's far better for having their support. That, that's for sure. I want to ask you about some of the some of the details just to get the lay of the land of Berkshire. But before I do, I want to ask you about something you mentioned before about when you when you sent the chapters to Buffett to review. And I'm just wondering, you hear that occasionally where someone will send something to Buffett and they'll hear back. And I just wanted to hear more about that process. I mean, I know he doesn't have any email, so I know you probably sent it in the mail. But how does that work when you when you send something to Buffett and, and you know get a response? So I've um, yeah. So let's see. So I, and actually, you know, another name to add to that list who who helped me was uh, Carol Loomis. I've had some communications with her and I, I actually asked her to, to edit the book, but she said, no, I, I, I don't have the time and uh, uh, to, to do it. Um, but she said, you know, if you send anything to Warren, it's got to be in print. Like, so, so I just, yeah, I just, I'm trying to think back. So I, I just, yeah, I think I just printed it all off and um, I might've even had it bound at Staples and, uh, and just sent it off to to omaha just you know their public address attention warren and uh just sitting there one day and i i get this email in my inbox from his assistant debbie basonic saying you know it was, it was it was written by by warren and he he probably hand wrote it i mean for all i know and uh and had debbie send it to me you know a message from from warren buffett and uh just extremely extremely motivating and just kind of like a little tidbit off of that uh just a thought that came to mind was 
So fast forward to 2000. So that was 2017. I think I first sent it to him. Fast forward to 2019 and I come home from the annual meeting. It's been a couple of years. And I said, geez, you know, I should, I should, I should tell Warren I'm still working on this book. And I shut off an email uh, to Debbie and just said, Hey, does, does Warren want to read this? I'm through maybe 2004. I've got 195,000 words. Uh, would love Warren to read it. And I uh, get another email back, you know, no, I don't need to, to read it now. Uh, looking forward to reading it when it's finished. And, and then it, it hit me afterwards, just last year, I said, geez, this is an incredible insight into how Warren manages and motivates his managers because these two emails over roughly, you know, this four year period just sustained me. And, and it's like, all right, I'm doing this for Warren, you know, and it, it was just, it was just an incredible, incredible motivating uh, thing to have. And then I have framed behind me a, a very nice letter he sent me after I, I sent him a almost finished, but hard copy uh, cover uh, or a uh, uh, hard copy edition of, of the book. So, uh, He's been he's been incredibly generous in, in his communication, uh, but I did not have any you know unlike unlike Alice Schroeder I did not have any privileged access to him I didn't ask get to ask him any specific questions anything like that. That's really awesome. Yeah, that, that's very that's very cool that he wrote back to you. Um, before we get into some of the details, I, I want to first maybe just get the lay of the land of Berkshire. You know, some of some of our viewers won't probably understand what Berkshire is today. And so I just wanted to, you know, we know Berkshire owns some stakes in public companies. They own entire companies. You know, they have this insurance operation. I was wondering if you could just maybe at a high level explain what Berkshire looks like today. Sure. So Berkshire Hathaway is large and it it is it's somewhat misunderstood because it's still you still hear today. Berkshire Hathaway is is a mutual fund that you get Warren Buffett to manage your money, which is not true. They have a huge, they have about a almost three hundred billion dollar marketable securities portfolio, and and so that's that's Warren Buffett, the stock picker, and that is the genesis of that is their insurance operation. So Berkshire Hathaway, it's, even today, is still very much an insurance business, with Geico being the most well known, but. They have a whole host of different primary insurance businesses. Um, uh, reinsurance business is, is huge, but uh, below the, the radar of most, let's say, retail investors. Uh, which is a bit, So insurance is a big, big chunk of their business. Then another big chunk is uh, the Berkshire Hathaway Energy, which is a utility business. They, they first got into that business in 1999, and it's grown to be quite, quite sizable in terms of uh, Berkshire's assets and earnings. Uh, and then another big chunk is the railroad, Burlington Northern Santa Fe, which they acquired in 2010. And then this next big chunk is the MSR or manufacturing service and retailing businesses. And, and those comprise everything from Seize Candy to uh, Precision Cast Parts, which is a, they, they make a lot of aerospace parts. Uh, um, and so there, there's literally hundreds and hundreds of businesses within that MSR group. So you sort of have these couple different big buckets, but then within that last bucket is a host of different uh, non-insurance operating subsidiaries. I was wondering, I think one of the things people don't understand completely about Berkshire, and you touched on this a little bit, is the whole role of insurance and the float and everything. I was wondering if you could just talk a little bit about how important that is to how Berkshire operates. Yeah, float even, and I've noticed, Jack, even even among investors, uh, and even value, some value investors don't quite have, they understand what float is, which is simply money that an insurance company holds before it's paid out. And so that can take the form of premiums up front, prepaying your, uh, your Geico auto premium, or it could be in the form of losses, which have been incurred, but have yet to be paid out. And so this, this pool of money, it's revolving and claims are, claims are going out and premiums are coming in. This pool of capital is available to be invested for the benefit of the insurer. And so at, at last year, year's end 2020, Berkshire had 139 billion of this float. And importantly, Berkshire has structured its insurance operations so that its cost of float has been negative. So they have 
they have generated an underwriting profit in most years recently, uh, but they did go through some struggles in the early days, and we, we can touch on that uh, later perhaps. Um, but, but Berkshire has structured its, its float to act very much like equity. And I have this discussion in the book, I think it's, I think it's 1995 when I talk about this, that float, float really as, as structured by Berkshire functions very much like equity without the dilution that equity has. And so when you have that in your mind, it helps to, it helps to put into context the, the premium that was paid for Geico, for example, uh, the the way that the general re transaction was structured when they when they bought that business, um, so and, and in Berkshire's early days, Buffett I came to realize Buffett would actually count this change in float almost as net income. So we're kind of getting deep here, but it was he he viewed it as a almost permanent cash flow that came in and, and it 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 bore fruit. This 139 billion of float was basically created from scratch and it's uh it's an incredible part of, of berkshire's growth and I, i've classified it as uh as rocket fuel to berkshire's success over time um we're going to get into some more of those details you talked about as, as we go through the individual decades but before we do that i wanted to ask you about you know buffett has been probably what most people would consider maybe in terms of the magnitude of his outperformance and the length of it potentially the best investor of all time and I wanted to see if you think there are any key traits he has that have led to that. You know, we, we had Lawrence Cunningham on the podcast and he talked about he thought the key trait was absorption or Buffett's ability to be a learner you know, at all times. And I'm wondering what you think maybe are some of the key traits he's shown that have allowed him to build the track record he has. Sure. Um, and so I guess my, my first thought, I go, I go back to what I think Charlie Munger said in his 2014 special letter, which was, Warren Buffett has been this learning machine, and that that is probably, I would say, I, I, I would not maybe rank these, but I guess the top three would probably be this this intense interest. He just has this intense interest in business, and it just, that natural curiosity leads him everywhere, coupled with an intense focus and then this continual learning. And so you have these three, three things kind of just propelling him forward. And I think Charlie has said in the past that Warren, if you stopped his progression at the end of any decade, would not have done nearly as well as he did in future decades because he continues to learn. And we've seen that recently with uh, you know their investment in, in Apple, for example. What do you think? You, you mentioned Munger. Um, what do you think the biggest influence he's had on Buffett is? Yeah, I, I guess... Probably that qualitative aspect. So that's that's what what Buffett says, and I I, I don't have anything really to add to that to use a, a mongerism. So Warren started as this quantitative guy, and he was the, the Ben Graham follower, and Ben Graham was able to make his living on these quantitative cigar butts buying s stocks for less than their their net net uh, working capital, and that was that was Buffett's foundation. And so to have Munger come in and say, "Hey, it's quality that matters," was a huge shift in his thinking. And so, and I think I think Charlie's actually said this that Buffett would have gotten there eventually, but you have to credit Charlie for pushing Warren along and, and getting him to that qualitative aspect, and that ultimately led to Seize Candies and Coke and some of these other great businesses that Berkshire's acquired over time. All right, before, before we move on, I just wanted to ask one other thing on this. Um, you know, Buffett is, whenever anybody talks about Buffett, they talk about, you know, all his great traits and all the many things he's done. And obviously he's been one of the most successful investors of all time, so that makes sense. But, you know, you usually don't see the other side of the coin. And I'm wondering if, you, if you've seen maybe, if you think there are any significant weaknesses in Buffett you've seen as you've studied his entire history that you think are worth highlighting. Yeah, it's hard to say. He, he has touched on... And it's a great question because it's so, and it's it's hard, right? You know, here we have this hero and this great investor. How do we how do we talk bad about him? But he's he's been very forthright in his investing errors. So the mistakes he's made uh, of of uh, of commission buying Dexter shoes in the the early '90s, which gave away some of Berkshire shares, which that the the value of what he got ultimately went to zero, but he gave away Berkshire. And some of the more explicit ones, and then even more recently with Precision Cast Parts saying he made a $10 billion mistake. And then 
And then you have the mistakes of omission where he said, geez, I should have bought Walmart sooner. Um, they, they had owned Freddie Mac shares and he said, geez, I should have bought Fannie sooner. Um, and, and, and so, the, and then Google, he said he missed Google and they could just see that it was obvious. So, so those, that's the investing side. And, and I've, um, I've thought about this on his personal side. And so one, one, uh, I guess anti lesson or one thing that I've personally chosen to, to not follow Warren's example in is in my personal life is really spending time with my kids and taking care of my body. Uh, so he, he really, in, in his early life, uh, and he's, it's since, I mean, it's worked out great, but I think his intense focus and his drive in his early years, he kind of neglected his family. And, and that's something I'm just not personally willing to do. And then this sort of myth of being able to survive on, uh, cherry cokes and C's candy and uh and mcdonald's uh it's certainly not for me i mean it, it's it works for warren buffett but uh i i i eat my broccoli unlike warren and uh i, I think i'm better for that so um i, I guess that, that's a great question and those are some things i take away from his personal life as well as his investment life yeah i had written an article and I was talking about like emulating Buffett and his investment strategy. But the way I opened it up was you probably don't want to emulate his diet and habits around food. <laughs> um, so uh, one of the one of the um, speaking of Apple, which you just mentioned, some people look at Berkshire Steak and Apple, which I think he basically started, you know, acquired his steak and Apple around thirty five billion. So it was a pretty big uh, it was a pretty big allocation relative to the public equity um stakes he has just generally but now it's worth something like and adam you may know the number exactly but something like maybe 120 billion they've sold a little bit um but basically it's one of you know it's one of the four jewels now um in berkshire hathaway and i'm just wondering do you some people look at that dollar amount so going from 35 billion to 120 billion as you know potentially the greatest investment in terms of money made over a short period of time um ever by anyone um and that may be true, but, you know, do you feel like or categorize as that being one of his greatest investments ever? Or are there other ones that really stand out head and shoulders to you above, you know, what he's been able to do with um, his return in Apple? Yeah, I think it's the numbers with Apple. It's it's the pure dollar amounts on, on an absolute basis that really highlight that. And so. I mean, even just recently, you can point to BYD. So Apple, thirty billion investment, call it a four X. Uh, BYD was was eight uh, or, or ten at, at the peak. Um, I would have to say, what is what is Berkshire's best investment? I would almost have to say it's it's National Indemnity. So they bought that business in in nineteen sixty seven for um, uh, eight point six million. They paid uh, 1.3, about 1.3 million over book value. That business, we just talked about the value of float. National Indemnity at that time had float of about 19 million. So they got this business for, uh, and, and he didn't know it at the time. It was only after the purchase that he really realized the value of float. So they got, the, they got that business for about half of float. Uh, so that's just the pure numbers. And then you have just this entry into insurance and, and without national indemnity and this entry into insurance, and maybe they would have gotten there over time, but that really allowed Berkshire to supercharge itself and, and national indemnity led to all the home state companies, which led to Geico, which so uh, insurance really has been the engine that has propelled Berkshire Hathaway over time. So I, I'd have to say national indemnity was probably uh, one of their probably the best. And, and I don't have any specific numbers to really quantify it other than to say, look at Berkshire's insurance operations today. And uh, w without it, they would really be nowhere near where they are today. Well, in doing research for this interview, I um, found a quote from Buffett in his 2004 shareholder letter, which he said, he said, quote, indeed, had we not made the acquisition of the National Indemnity Company, Berkshire would be lucky to be worth half of what it is today. And that was in 2004. So I think you're exactly right. He was basically saying, you know, at that point, had they not made that 
um, acquisition, you know, the company probably would be worth half of what it was in 04. So I think that's a, your points um, probably spot on given what Buffett has said himself. Yeah, and, and they, they invested, even you look back in the, the early days, Safeco, and Buffett says this in some of his letters that Safeco was another insurer and he said they, they are a better insurance operation than our own insurance operation. And then when they bought into Geico as an investment, so just being able to understand it as well as the owning it and controlling insurers are really, uh, it's just an incredible part of, of their history. One of the things that seems sort of a disconnect to me, and I, I'm, not, I'm not asking you to comment on the stock per se, but it's, you know, I want to ask you about what you think the most underappreciated investment in Berkshire Hathaway is. And I'd like to hear your comments on that, but sort of related to, to that question is, you know, I look at Buffett's stake in Apple. He obviously has a lot of finance companies in his public uh, stock portfolio, but even on the operating company side, you know, these businesses took a hit in, during the pandemic, but a lot of them have, um, I think, come back and insurance probably has been protected. I mean, rail got hit, but it's just, it's kind of weird in terms of underappreciation. I, I personally feel like Berkshire stock over the last, you know, year, year and a half is certainly being underappreciated by the investment community. Um, but maybe it's just the sort of the risk on appetite or the cash drag, or there's different things at play there. But um, I guess I guess I'm making a comment there, but also I'm asking a question of you of what do you think of the holdings that Berkshire holds is the most underappreciated by investors? Do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, well, I have a couple of thoughts. I mean, I guess you are you asking like like what what is the part of Berkshire maybe that's most undervalued or in a historical perspective, uh, maybe one that's gotten forgotten because I. Um, I think I think it more the, the one that's the current part of Berkshire that's being most undervalued today or that's being perceived as being undervalued. Yeah. So. Uh, and you can you can look across the whole business and, and you can almost say. Well, certainly the whole of Berkshire and you, you look at this most recent deal uh, in the railroad uh, industry, which seems to indicate that. Uh, Berkshire, uh, the, the Burlington North, the Santa Fe is undervalued. Then you look at the energy business and you say, okay, the, for, a first class utility operation that spans uh, the West Coast and, and the potential that they have there with tens of billions of dollars worth of investment uh, in the pipeline that they haven't even put on the books. Um, then the, the manufacturing uh, service and retailing businesses as a whole, even even with the weaknesses in in precision cast parts and some of the other places, um, so it's it's almost this uh, flashback or or repeat of the, the late '90s when Berkshire as a whole was undervalued, and and so it's easy to point to Apple and, and the marketable securities portfolio, which generally speaking is is worth what it's quoted at. Uh, which is a big, big chunk of Berkshire's value. So I, I guess I, I'd kind of say everything, but I can't really point to something specific. But there's just every every aspect of Berkshire you look at, it just says you just you come you come away saying this is an incredible business, and you can't help but think that it's it's underappreciated. Um, well, one of the things that's sort of come out of Berkshire maybe being underappreciated is you know he's he the performance of Berkshire has struggled you know in the recent decade and. Obviously, if you look at the beginning years, way at the beginning of his history, it's much better than it was at the end. And, you know, the question is how much of that is just the fact that he's running a massive scale relative to what he used to, and how much of that is maybe things have changed in the market and maybe, you know, he's not as skilled or, or something like that as he was. And I'm just wondering if you could comment on that, if how much do you think of Berkshire's own performance is just maybe his style is out of favor or he's running too much size or how much of it is maybe things have changed in the market and maybe his skill is not what it once was? Yeah, I'd like to think, you know, and I, I'm, of course, uh, extremely biased here, right? I just wrote a whole book about it, and he's my hero. But I'd like to think that a 90-year-old man have, and Munger at 97 can continue this, this learning. Uh, and and you, have, you have the younger guys like, like Weschler and Combs there that will certainly bring ideas to Buffett. So I think it may just be a, a matter of sort of all of the above. And some of it being out of favor, but then you have, you know, most recently in last year at this time when the Fed stepped in and just plowed unlimited money 
uh, into the economy, we didn't have a, a situation like uh, October of 2008, where they put 14 and a half billion dollars to work in two weeks. Uh, I mean, that would have been that would have been huge for Berkshire at, at very good, very good rates. And so I think it's sort of all of the above. You have excess capital out there, which is abundant in itself. And then you have low interest rates, which allow others which are OK, who are OK, borrowing money to lever up, which Berkshire doesn't doesn't do. And then you have just the, the sheer fact that Berkshire Hathaway has 500 billion roughly of equity capital. And how do you grow a business of that size at any meaningful clip? So this this universe of opportunities has shrunk. And so you sort of just take it all together and say, wow, this is just a really tough, tough point in Berkshire's history. But then then you to to maintain some optimism, you look at a, an investment like Apple and you say, OK, Buffett, Berkshire, just call it Berkshire, can learn from just continue to learn. And even if they're late on some of these investments, they can still do well, because if they can find these compounders, if you're late, you're still going to be able to ride that exponential curve up. So I, I think. I would venture a, a guess that Berkshire through this period will, will look kind of like the past and we'll see, okay, this is what happened. And, and Buffett really is managing Berkshire to survive anything uh, over the next, you know, thousand years, hundred years. He just has such a long-term time horizon that, uh, you know, he, he's okay waiting. He's okay waiting. And, and history bears out that things will probably uh, be okay as, with that culture at, in place at Berkshire. Yeah, it's, it's funny because, you know, we run we run some portfolios ourselves and we have our, our investable universe is something like 2,800 companies. And I, and I often think when we're deploying that, I think, how much harder was it to be him? I mean, of those 2,800 companies, how many could he even consider at his scale? You know, it's, it's a very, very small fraction. So anybody, no matter how good you are, is going to have trouble doing that, I would think. Yeah, and you really have to wonder, and maybe they've sort of done some advertising, I guess, of, of a sorts in Europe, and and they've had they've owned Iscar IMC since uh, 2006, so it, it would not be inconceivable for them to to find a, a 50 billion dollar acquisition, even a hundred billion dollar acquisition, somewhere in the world, and. But you you do see, and, and I have a chart in the book of their outperformance of the S and P on a rolling ten year basis over time, and you just see it you see it kind of come down. But even if they can continue to just outperform over a couple percentage points over time, I mean, you guys know that that a couple percent over twenty five years really adds up. And so uh, I, I don't think I think we've shifted into this capital return phase, but I don't think Berkshire's opportunities are behind it. Yeah, like you kind of pointed out earlier, though, too, I mean, Buffett has, you know, clearly kind of tried to manage expectations and say, listen, the, the returns that you're going to get, you know, in the current Berkshire Hathaway, they're not going to be anything like the 20 percent per year, you know, for the last 55 years. I mean, we're a much larger company. It's much harder to find investment opportunity. So he's been pretty forthright with shareholders and, you know, letting them know that um, those types of returns are probably not going to um you know, happen, that type of outperformance isn't going to happen in the future. Um, we wanted to um, kind of get into sort of how you structure the book. So go through some of these decades here. There's there's so much we could sort of talk about. So I don't know how much time we're going to have in each one of these different 10-year periods. But maybe to start, Adam, I thought it would be good if you just Maybe spend a minute or two on like like what Buffett asked you, like the pre, not going all the way back to the beginning of the textile industry in the U.S., but, you know, I think when a lot of people think of Berkshire Hathaway, they think Warren Buffett founded Berkshire Hathaway, but that's not actually the case. I mean, Berkshire was an existing textile business that Buffett um, ultimately bought into and took control over, right? Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll give you a brief brief glimpse at the, the very early uh, early story, and I don't spend a, a whole lot of time on this, but I, I wanted to include it for completeness sake, and I think it, it's a fascinating story. So late, late 1700s, this guy Samuel Slater sneaks out of England. He steals the know-how to build uh, uh, textile plants from England. 
sneaks out. I mean, this is this is like espionage. Uh, Tom Russo's uh, a quote uh, uh, for me on the book kind of speaks to this: that hey, high technology back in in the early days, uh, but it, it really was. And so this technology comes out of comes out of England and it lands in, in New England and uh, the sperm whaling industry is on its downfall and that capital that's built up allows the investment into uh, the New England area and, and, and then you have this natural advantage over the south of the, the rivers that we have uh, which are just are just so strong and, and powerful and so that's uh, that's that's the genesis of the industry and then there was a whole host of uh, whole host of different textile mills, and so you just have this natural industry uh, growth, maturation, uh, and then consolidation over time. And so we, we started to see this in um, like the the early 1900s, 1920s. All of these little mills start as as the technology shifts as the the southern United States gets access to power uh, which means that the rivers don't become as as important the technology uh, or these these mills become uh, necessary to consolidate and so uh, the, the Berkshire Hathaway that existed in 1955 with all these different plants you know, the North Adams plant the um, the Fall River plant all of those individual plant locations were actually, Standalone mills that consolidated into uh, into Berkshire Fine Spinning Associates in 1929. They picked up another couple little mills a couple of years later, and then in 1955 uh, they merged uh, with Berkshire or merged with Hathaway, and then that became Berkshire Hathaway. Um, but it, it really it really was fascinating, and, and I'm grateful to Ward for pointing me to this, because uh, I'm not sure I would have gone back that far on my own, but you really see, you see this tough industry period in the early uh, pre-World War II days. That causes profitability to go down. Some of these mills consolidate, go out of business, so forth. And then World War II hits, and they have this huge run-up. They're the only ones around, and they get this huge run-up in profitability. And then this sort of slow trend starts to happen again. And so by the time Warren gets on the scene in 1965, it really is, it's a dying industry. It's struggling. And one thing that attracted him to, to Berkshire Hathaway was the fact that they were actually repurchasing their shares. So they spent about $13 million in the 55 to 64 period buying back their own shares, which was roughly, roughly they roughly shrunk the business in half. It was about a 40%. Uh, return of capital in the form of share buybacks, which was kind of unusual for a business like that to do that at the time. So that's that sort of sets the stage for for Warren to arrive in uh, in 1965. And so he was basically investing in the company through the partnership, and then he eventually gained control of the firm. Yeah, it, Berkshire Hathaway was a one investment among many in the the Buffett Partnership Limited, which was his. His, uh, his investment partnership. And so he, he saw what Berkshire was doing, repurchasing its, its shares. He saw that there was a margin of safety in the uh, working capital compared to the share price. And he starts buying the shares. And then you have this famous snuff of Seabury Stanton uh, meeting with Warren and saying, yep, I'll give you, uh, I'll give you this this per share, and then it was literally twelve and a half cents per share because they were they were quoted in, in eighths at the time. But twelve and a half cents per share set off uh, Warren Buffett on the course to take control of Berkshire Hathaway, and that's why we're we're talking about it today. So we, we very well could be talking about a different company today if it wasn't for that snub by uh, by Seabury Stanton way back there in um, the nineteen sixties. One of the other things I learned in prepping for this, which I. I I'm not nearly as knowledgeable, anywhere nearly as knowledgeable as you, but I have, you know, tried to read Berkshire's letters. I'm a huge fan, obviously, of Warren Buffett. We were on a model, I have a couple of books, but this idea, or not the idea, this company, Blue Chip Stamps, and how important this company was in terms of, well, I guess, in terms of, like, um, allowing, well, 
Buffett and Munger kind of, I think, to some extent brought them together, but also using the float from the company to basically buy other companies. So do you want to, and I'm kind of in like the mid seventies, early eighties time period, I guess now. Um, and there's a lot of other things going on too with them buying other companies, but this blue chip stamps was an important entity, um, in the development of Berkshire at the time. Can you just sort of explain what was going on with that one? Sure. And, and yeah, it just, uh, I, I made the comment, uh, someone else that we, we very well could be sitting around talking about blue chip stamps because that could have been the vehicle that, that Warren chose. And so that was an entity that, again, they, they found, and I say they, uh, at this, this point, uh, Buffett had teamed up, uh, I guess, informally with Charlie Munger. They met in 1959. And so they, uh, Charlie had his own partnership and they, they were buying into this company, Blue Chip Stamps. And, and Blue Chip Stamps was a, another float business. And this was, uh, this is a, a, an, uh, an industry that was foreign to me. I mean, when I first heard of trading stamps, I said, what is this? Um, but it was a float business because these merchants would buy these stamps and then they would give them away as uh, incentives for gas gas purchases or any other kind of, of, of purchases. Uh, but it was an it was an inherent inherently uh, it was a, a floaty business. I don't know what the what you call it, but um, it was a business that had this incredible float. Uh, but that was a business that was in its decline, and so almost it was almost a repeat of the Berkshire Hathaway playbook, which was shrink the textile business, buy investments, buy other, other businesses. They did the same thing with blue chip stamps, uh, managing down that trading stamp business and using that float to buy uh, C's candy. So C's was, was actually purchased with blue chip stamps uh, in 1972. And then you have uh, other businesses like uh, Wesco, um, uh, and a couple others that ultimately went under the blue chip umbrella. But at this point, and, and they actually got into some, some trouble, some legal trouble with the SEC because they just, it was just like having multiple pocketbooks or wallets or stashes of cash around. They would just pull wherever they needed to for this capital. And uh, there was a lot of cross holdings. Blue chip owned some of of Berkshire and Berkshire on some of blue chip and it was just this mess, this tangled web. Uh, but, but over time they became, uh, inseparable. And then with blue chip, it was 1983 that they, uh, they merged. And then before that it was uh, diversified retailing in 1978. Those are kind of the three, uh, predecessor companies, if you will, of, of, uh, the, the, the modern day Berkshire Hathaway. Yeah. It's interesting how all these companies were sort of like, like this web of companies. And like you said, they were pulling capital from and then kind of investing in different things and looking for undervalued opportunities. So it's a very interesting and important time for, for Berkshire Hathaway, um, for sure. Um, and then kind of, kind of coming into, I guess, the 80s and 90s, one of the other things that um, I, I guess I realized in doing a little prep for this is, so it's an 85 where... Buffett and Berkshire backed the Capital Cities takeover of um, ABC, which at the time, and this is what uh, I read, and I think this is correct, that at the time it was the largest non-oil merger in business history. Um, and Buffett, I think, put up, you know, they put up like 500 million, which, you know, back then, I don't know how, how big Berkshire was, but I'm sure that was a pretty decent size you know, allocation given the size of the company. So that was clearly a, a big move um, for them at the time. It was, it, it, it really was. And um, I'll, I'll just, I want to, I want to take a, a quick step back to the, um, the prior decade, because I, I just want to make sure that I highlight it um, because we were talking about insurance and how insurance is, is so important to Berkshire today. The, the growth of insurance, so they, they bought national indemnity uh, in, in 1967. And then they went about forming all of these home state companies, uh, which were simply companies that operated in uh, in one particular state. And um, but it wasn't it wasn't Berkshire. It almost looks so so clear today that Berkshire was success, and you have Warren Buffett at the helm. But they had a lot of failures in insurance in the early days, and I think it was one of the most fascinating things for me to see. Um, 
they, they had a couple of these, like Lakeland Fire and, and, uh, and Casualty in Minnesota. They form it in 1971, and then it closes in 1982. Um, Insurance Company of Iowa was formed in 73, and then they merge it into this company called Cornhusker in, in 1980. Um, they, they bought this home and auto business in Chicago. It operated in, in Cook County, which, was, uh, which is a Chicago market. Wonderful business. They say, well, let's try to replicate this in Miami. It completely fails. Um, they have some other they have some other issues with uh, with workers comp in California, and so you have this ten year period from about eighty two to ninety two with underwriting losses in every single year, and so that it, it's a formative part of Berkshire's history. This this painful time of figuring out how to make insurance profitable, and then of course the 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 seminal event in nineteen eighty five is the arrival of a Jeep Jane. To Berkshire, and that's just uh, history, as they say. So, so that that by the time they get to this 1985, and so uh, I start each decade at, at the mid-year point. So, uh, 85 would be the, the start of that next decade. Uh, they really have a lot of advantages going for them, and they have they've built up Berkshire to such a point where they can do these deals with uh, with some other larger players like Cap Cities to help them finance. Uh, their acquisition of ABC. Um, so, so that yeah, the, the, the mid '80s. Um, uh, you have to remind me of your original question. Well, no, yeah, it was just it was it was a, the it was kind of the size of that and how it was such a large deal at the time. But I think your point is is a really good one. It's like those failures in insurance actually helped set the stage for all the good underwriting practices and the way that they manage their insurance operations going forward. So that was a very important. Uh, you know, piece of history, especially for their insurance operations. Um, and then if you want to, you know, then coming into sort of the next decade, um, 95, 96, which is where they basically bought the rest of Geico. Yeah. So, so Geico and, and again, I, I don't, I, I keep stepping back here, but I, the, the 1986 acquisition of Scott Fetzer is, is one of my favorites because it, it nearly doubles. And I'll just touch on it quickly. Um, we could spend hours on this stuff. It, Scott Fetzer had 700 million in revenues. They buy it for um, a little over 300 million. It nearly doubles their revenues. It's this huge acquisition. Uh, and Scott Fetzer owned, it was a mini conglomerate. It owned 20 different businesses under, under that one umbrella, including uh, Kirby and, and World Book. And what's so fascinating, there's just so many things about Scott Fetzer, but that business didn't really grow that much over time. In fact, some of the components shrunk. And you fast forward to uh, the early uh, 2000s, and that business literally fades to a footnote in Berkshire Hathaway's financial statements. Uh, and to me, it was an example of uh, th this other lesson, which is businesses don't have to grow. Uh, Scott Fetzer and the, the CEO, uh, Ralph Shea, would just send he would he would ring out these efficiencies in these businesses and send excess cash to Omaha and uh, and he was rewarded handsomely and and Berkshire did really well but it just didn't the business didn't grow so it didn't become a huge part of Berkshire but the the cash that it it, it threw off was uh, was really so important to Berkshire's growth and so and some of that cash and so just to kind of tie in your your question in in the, the mid 1990s. Uh, so, so they buy the other half of Geico that they they didn't own. So that that investment started as a marketable securities purchase in 1976 when Geico went through some trouble, and then uh, over time they they originally bought uh, it was in the 20s percent uh, part of Geico, and then they increased it to about 33 percent, and then they didn't buy any other shares, and just by virtue of Geico repurchasing its own shares. They ended up uh, in the mid 1990s with half the company, and so that original cost uh, of uh, 40 some odd million dollars, they pay 2.3 billion for the other half of Geico, and that purchase was about two and a half times book value. So then you can you contrast that to way back in '67 with uh, National Indemnity at uh, at book value. But then you look at the float and you say, okay, if you you consider, and, and this is the chapter where I have that discussion about float as equity, 
the the float adjusted cost of Geico was was one x. They they bought it at at equity plus float, uh, and, and they basically got all of this growth for free. And, and in hindsight, we can say with uh, d- definitively that it was an incredible investment. Uh, and, and Geico today is is throwing off uh, in, in the mid thirty billions worth of uh, premiums every year, and which is is probably roughly uh, roughly what its float is. So it's an incredible, incredible business. And so, yeah, as 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 uh, as Berkshire grew in the 90s and, and they're, they're able to just all these businesses that they're picking up and, and Berkshire doesn't pay a dividend. They're able to buy um, uh, flight safety for a billion and a half in, in 96. Um, they buy Dairy Queen, Executive Jet. Benjamin Moore, and then we're starting to get into the, the early 2000s, Shaw Carpet and all these other ones. But really, you just see this flywheel continuing and, and the pace of acquisitions really increase over time as we get into the uh, the early 2000s. Um, yeah. And so just uh, that's where we are. You have a great on your website, which what's the uh, site that you have the timeline? Oracle's Classroom? Yeah, the oraclesclassroom.com. Yeah. Yeah, so that's a real nice, there's a timeline that shows you all the sort of key big acquisitions of uh, Berkshire over time, which is a real nice resource, I think. But in the, just in terms of the last 15 years or so, I mean, could you just highlight maybe the top three or four acquisitions um, that Berkshire has made? I mean, we've kind of mentioned some of them, but it just in, in terms of wrapping up this history here, I mean, what are the major ones? We obviously talked about his stake in Apple. That's not necessarily an acquisition of an operating company, but it's just more of a public stock. But what would be the other top ones in your mind um, that he's put quite a significant amount of capital to work? Really interesting. My, one of my favorite charts in the book is I, I did an analysis of largest, um, the, the most significant capital allocation decisions by decade, and so when I when I say decade, it's 65 to 74, 74 to uh, 80, uh, or 75 to 84, and so on. Um, so you, you see, you see the largest single stock, common stock investment is no less than uh, about a quarter of their portfolio. But then you look at at the top, um, the top a- acquisitions, and here here's where it really was interesting to me, and I'll just run through a couple of them uh, o- over time, and, and you'll see kind of the logic as we get to, to the more modern day. Um, this this idea of larger and larger acquisitions over time. So uh, one of the, the largest was the Illinois Bank uh, in uh, 1969, which was 44 percent of Berkshire's equity capital at the time, and by contrast, uh, National Indemnity was 28 percent. And then we, we walk through the, the decades, and I have the top two, but I'll just touch on the top, the, the largest. In the next decade, uh, ending in 84, it was Buffalo News, and that was at 15%. Scott Fetzer, which we talked about, was was 19%. Uh, Geico represented 18%. That was in, in 1996. And then BNSF, uh, the railroad, uh, which we touched on earlier, was 18% of Berkshire's equity capital at the time of acquisition. And so... It really, it really has been this. Uh, when you look at its history, you look at this arc, this concentrated approach to both investments as well as operating businesses. Which, as we touched on uh, a little earlier, that just sets up Berkshire for the extreme challenge of how do they put fifteen percent of five hundred billion to work? Uh, you know, you're, you're talking. Um, you're talking a 75% or $75 billion acquisition, right? So uh, those numbers are just going to get larger and larger over time. So, um, uh, so I think we've, I think we've touched on that. And then most more recently, I guess, uh, precision cast parts, which was 2016. Um, and they really haven't, they really haven't found, they came really close to that, um, uh, Unilever transaction with 3G a, a couple of years ago, but really they, they haven't had, the at bats for these large acquisitions, uh, like they've had in their history, uh, in, in its more recent history. As we uh, as we wrap up here, I just had one more. Um, you mentioned you, the annual meeting is sort of what got you started on the process of writing this book, and you know I've never had the privilege to be at the annual meeting, but it sounds like a really amazing experience. And I was just wondering if you could talk a little bit about the annual meeting and maybe some of the cool things that go on that uh, you know for people who are maybe considering attending it. I mean, I guess you have to own, first of all, you have to own one share, right, in order to go. Is that the right rule? 
you know, it used to be the case, but pretty much anybody can go at this point. And, and uh, just a, a quick little tidbit. So 1996, Berkshire issues its B shares, and they did that because uh, somebody was going to create a, a unit trust and, and basically split the A's but take a, a cut of it. And people were actually, you can, you can get four tickets, four passes to go to the, the meeting. And, uh, and people were getting four passes and then putting them up on eBay and selling them. And Buffett just hates, he just does not like his shareholders to get taken advantage of. So he said, anybody that wants to come, write to us, we'll give you a pass. So today, anybody can come to, to Omaha and see uh, the Woodstock for Capitalists, which is what Buffett terms it. And it really is, it really is an incredible, incredible thing. Uh, I, I'd, I'd encourage you guys to, to get out there. It's, it's so much fun. Uh, so the main, the main event is the five-ish hours of Warren and Charlie on stage answering questions from shareholders. And so it starts uh, at 8.30. Typically, they have, uh, they have about an hour-long movie, which is produced by uh, Susie Buffett, Buffett's daughter. Uh, and they get they get these incredible celebrities, and, and part of doing this, they, they allow no recording, uh, they don't put it out there. These people do this for free, but they've gotten people like Arnold Schwarzenegger and people, the actresses from Desperate Housewives, and um, a couple of years ago with that uh, that Manny Pacquiao fight, they had a, a little skit of him, you know, beating up. Uh, I mean, it was just they they do these wonderful things. So it's it's it starts with this hour fun movie you get to see some some new commercials even from some of the subsidiaries and even coca-cola might release uh some new commercials for for berkshire shareholders to see so you just it's just such a fun atmosphere 9 30 starts the q a and then it goes from 9 30 to about noon hour lunch and then you're, you're back out to about 3 30 uh, with the q a so that's that's sort of the nexus and then all along in the background, they have a, a 200,000 square foot exhibition hall. And, and I should say that this is held in, uh, I think it's now the CHI Center in Omaha, which is a, a big, big arena. Uh, about 40,000 people go out there. And as I say in the introduction to my book, it really, it's, it's like 40,000 friends when you go out there. People are just happy to be there. It's a fun time. And so this exhibition hall is where all the Berkshire subsidiaries, uh, a lot of them, and some of the major investments uh, like Coca-Cola and, and Mars have uh, set up the display booths. So it's kind of this like, I don't know, carnival atmosphere, but it's a celebration, I think is the way Charlie termed it. And so you have, you have C's candy selling uh, candy there. You have, you can buy some Brooks shoes at a discount, Fruit of the Loom, of course, and get, a, you know, packs of underwear for five bucks or something. It's just, it's, it's a ton of fun, but that, that is sort of like the center of the weekend, so that's Saturday. Then, then you have everything else going on around it. So you can fly. I typically fly out Friday and then leave uh, Sunday. But some people go out as early as, as Wednesday or Thursday. But Thursday, Friday, Friday is really when things start to get get hopping in Omaha. And um, you have Creighton University, which usually puts on a panel discussion. You have uh, some other. Investors put on seminars, private, uh, some are, are public. You have guys like Whitney Tilson. Uh, they, they rent rooms at the, uh, the Hilton and, and, and invite anybody in. You can go in, you can have coffee, you can have drinks on, on Whitney. It's just really this, this great atmosphere. And then Sunday, um, so that, that's Friday. And then Saturday, there's sort of some, I guess, after parties, you could say, uh, after the, the event. And everybody's talking about what Warren uh, had to say during the, during the meeting. And then Sunday, a lot of people will, will start to head home. Uh, I usually attend the Markel brunch, which is uh, at 10 o'clock, uh, typically held, uh, held right there, either across the street or they actually just built a new Marriott. Uh, they've, been, they've been holding it there. Um, and, and then things, things kind of die down. And so Sunday, people are, are typically flying out. So it's this whole, whole event. And then Berkshire actually sponsors uh, some other things, um, like you can go to Borsheim's, they have a little party there in the, in the courthouse, uh, courtyard, I should say. Um, there's, there's all, there's all these, these events and then the stores in Nebraska Furniture Mart, you can go and they have, it's just, it's an incredible, incredible place. And uh, it, it's going to be really, I've been going for, this would have been my 10th year out there in person. Of course, last year I wasn't able to make it. Um, but you see, I, I'd, I'd estimate like a good, at least half, probably, probably more of 
returning attendees every year and then there's this sort of steady flow of uh, of new people coming out and checking it out for the first time but uh, it'll be interesting to see you know inevitably when when Warren and Charlie step down what happens and and I plan to continue to go out there because I think these relationships that are formed are just they're just so important and they're just so they're so special and, and you see I mean I had the, the opportunity to shake Jack Bogle's hand when he was out there uh, you can talk to some of the managers. I met uh, uh, Matt Rose, who was the CEO of, of Burlington Northern Santa Fe. I mean, how, how many places do you get this access to um, to these these CEOs? And it's just everybody's there. I met Tony nicely one year. Everybody's just happy to be there. It's a fun time. Uh, you have no no inhibitions about loading up on sugar, uh, which Warren you know encourages everybody to do shop. So it's uh, it's an incredible incredible time. Nothing like it in person. It's great. Good good stuff, Adam. Well, listen, we want to wish you um, all the best uh, success with this uh, book. You've put in a lot of time, effort, and dedication. I think your knowledge on Berkshire Hathaway uh, clearly shines through. And I think that uh, for anyone that's, you know, wants to understand sort of where Berkshire has come from and the history here, I think this book is probably going to be pretty much the definitive guide for you. So um, I'm looking forward to ordering it and um, diving in. And if people would like to just learn more about you, your firm, um, follow you on Twitter or social media, I mean, where can they go to find out more? Sure. Um, yeah. And so I'd say just to, again, to use a Charlie Munderism, low expectations, right? There's been a ton of great books on Berkshire. I, I have low expectations going into this. I don't expect it to be a bestseller, but I, I hope it deserves a place on people's bookshelf. Uh, so I, I run a, a separate accounts. I run a long only uh, value based uh, uh, firm, Mead Capital. That's Mead, MeadCM.com. Uh, you can learn more at the OraclesClassroom.com, which is I put a ton of archives out there. For uh, from what I learned, and a lot of the a lot of the, the predecessor company financials, and, and including that timeline that you mentioned, and then uh, just recently I started uh, an investing newsletter called uh, Watchlist Investing. So uh, you can go to watchlistinvesting.com, check that out. And uh, I'm on Twitter. I just started ramping up my Twitter presence. Uh, my handle is at uh, brk underscore student. So uh, love to answer questions. I also have a YouTube channel, uh, theoraclesclassroom.com. Uh, always looking for suggestions for videos, and, and again, I, I hope uh, I hope the discussion and, and this community uh, we can we can all continue to learn from Berkshire, and so I look I look forward to hearing from folks. Great, Adam. Thank you for joining us today. We appreciate it. Thank you. This is great. Thanks for having me on. This was a lot of fun. Hi guys, this is Justin again. Thanks so much for tuning into this episode of Excess Returns. You can follow Jack on Twitter at, at @practicalquant and follow me on Twitter at, at JJ Carboneau. If you found this discussion interesting and valuable, please subscribe in either iTunes or on YouTube or leave a review or a comment. We appreciate it.